Today is March 19th, 2021, and my guest is sociologist and author Mark Rank of Washington University in St. Louis. He is the author of Poorly Understood, What America Gets Wrong About Poverty, co-authored with Lawrence Eppard and Heather Bullock, and that book is our topic for today. Mark, welcome to Econ Talk. Oh, thanks, Ross. It's great to be with you. So let's talk about poverty to start with in the general sense, and we'll get to the details of the book, which is uh, quite interesting. Uh, but I want to start with the question of what is poverty? Obviously, it has a subjective and can have an objective measure. So talk about what the objective measures are that you use in the book. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to talk about some of the other senses of the word, that's fine, too. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a great place to start. Um, you know, what do, we, what do we actually mean by poverty and how do we actually measure poverty? So the way that we um, talk about poverty in the book, for the most part, is the way that the, um, the Census Bureau defines poverty. And that is basically to say, if folks uh, earn below a certain income level, we're going to count them in poverty. If they're above that level, uh, we're not going to count them in poverty. And the concept there is that if you fall below a certain income level, you really don't have the resources to have a decent, minimally adequate um, lifestyle. And so in the United States um, for last year, uh, that poverty line for a family of three was around $20,000. So if that family earned um, less than $20,000 during the year, they would be counted as in poverty. If they were above that, they would not be counted as in poverty. Um, and the poverty line varies depending on the size of the household, because obviously larger households need more income to get by than smaller households. Um, but that's, that's pretty much um, how we measure poverty. Now, there's been a lot of critiques about the measurement of poverty in the United States. And, and most people uh, argue that it's a pretty conservative measure, um, that if you think about trying to survive on less than $20,000 a year, it's pretty difficult. And the other thing that I'll just point out, you know, in this sort of beginning, uh, beginning uh, discussion here is that that $20,000 represents poverty at its most opulent level. So in other words, if you earn $1 more, you're out of poverty. It turns out that about 45% of people in the United States fall below half the official poverty line. So instead of uh, falling below $20,000, imagine a family of three trying to survive on less than $10,000. What was that number again? Say that again, what proportion? So about 45% of everybody in poverty in the United States fall below half of the official poverty okay, line. Okay, right. So it's almost half of folks in poverty. Um, so almost half and, the folks and, and, in and, poverty are terribly poor. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, are, are, are in ex what we might call extreme poverty. And interestingly, that percentage of poor folks in extreme poverty has actually been rising over the last 20 or 30 years. And what's the proportion of people who fall below the official poverty line say, yeah. for 2020. Yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, the latest data is is for uh, 2019. And uh, it actually is, at, was it, for 2019, was at a, a low point in terms of thinking historically about poverty. So 10 and a half percent of the population fell below the um, the official poverty line in 2019. Uh, I, I've often um, pointed out that many of these Measures are difficult to compare over time because of changes in family structure. Uh, the proportion of households headed by single women with children, which has the – that is the subgroup of family structure with the highest poverty rate. Uh, that group has gotten larger. So just looking at the poverty rate – as a measure of how the economy treats people is not, over mm -hmm. time, is not fully informative because uh, family structure is changing. Now, you could argue that mm -hmm. the economy is not making enough opportunities for single women with children uh, or that they have trouble getting married because of the economy. And those are, mm -hmm. those are real issues, obviously. But I think I just want to remind listeners mm – -hmm. That when you make mm -hmm. comparisons over time, and a lot of what we're going to be talking about is a different kind yeah. of com overtime comparison, but it's really important to remember that family structure change has changed dramatically in the United States. And since these yeah. measures are typically household measures, not individual mm -hmm. measures, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a little bit tricky. And one more point I want to make in, about the data and, and the challenge of interpreting it is that this is very hard to understand, but it's really important. Over the last 40 or 50 years, the number of households in the United States has increased much more dramatically than the actual population. And that's because there's more divorce, less marriage, more people, those two factors. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so the, even though the population has increased by a certain amount, the number of households increased by more than that. And many of them are not two, fam two earner families. So measures of say average income, even median income, and certainly poverty are distorted by that if you make comparisons over time. Yeah, and um, you know that's a good point. Um, what I talk about, you know, I teach a course on poverty and inequality every semester here at Washington University, and um, one of the things I point out is that it's just what you're saying, which is that the overall poverty rate, you know, tells us something, but it 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 certainly is affected by demographic changes in the population, and as you right, rightly point out. Probably the main demographic change that has happened which affects poverty is the rise of single parent families who, as you say, are at a significant risk of experiencing poverty. About 35% of all single parent families uh, fall below the poverty line. So that certainly is, a, uh, is, a, is an important factor in terms of thinking about the overall rate of poverty. And that's why sometimes what people will do is they'll look at particular groups like single parent families and they'll look at how have they changed over time right. in terms of their rate of poverty. Yeah. And they've often fallen, even though the overall poverty rate changed because that subgroup with the higher rate has gotten more numerous. And those who are interested in that, I have a video on that. We'll put a link to it. Uh, it's called Simpson's Paradox. It's interesting, but we're not going to get into it on uh, in audio. Um, the other thing I want to I want you to clarify is mm -hmm. you use the measure of I think you said twenty thousand for a family to three. Mm -hmm. Where does that who? It's a, it's yeah. somewhat interesting how yeah. that number yeah. is calculated yeah. is kind yeah. of yeah historically of of interest to me anyway. It is Talk so. Um, in 1964, um, President Lyndon Johnson famously declared a war on poverty and said, you know, uh, it, we are going to fight a war on poverty. It's not right that in this wealthy country we have so many folks in poverty. So if you declare war on somebody. Uh, you need to know the strength of the enemy, right? And uh, and up until this time, we had no official measure of poverty. So a woman by the name of Molly Orshansky in the um, Social, Social Security Administration uh, was charged with coming up with a measure. And the measure that she used is pretty much the same measure uh, that is used today. It hasn't really changed very much. And here's how it's done. You basically um, figure out what for that household of, let's say that household of three, what do they need during the year to purchase a minimally adequate diet? And that's based on the agricultural department's um, survey of, of food and things like that. So what do they need to purchase a minimally adequate diet? Let's figure out that number. We multiply that number by three, and that's the poverty line. Yeah. Now you might say, well, why do we multiply it by three? Is that some kind of you know, special number? Or what, what's the deal there? At the time, uh, the survey showed that in, in general, average, a typical family in America spent about a third of their income on food, another two thirds on all the other things, shelter, housing, and, all, and clothing and all that. So the, the argument was, if we can figure out what the minimum amount is for food, we can multiply that by three, and that's the other minimum amount that you need for these basic goods and services to have a decent life. That's how the poverty line was devised, and that's still how it's measured. And, and one of the critiques of that measure is this multiplier of three, because what people say is, look, the amount that families are spending now on housing, childcare, all of these things are much more than they were 50 years ago. And therefore, the argument is that, you know, that multiplier should be something like four or five instead of three. But, but that's basically the way it's devised, and, uh, and, it, and it has remained that way ever since. A couple other caveats I want to point out about that. Um, I worked for the Social Security Administration. I came out of college for Mm. Eight months before I went to uh, graduate school, and I think I met Molly. I'm, mm. I'm, I'm pretty sure I did. Wow! Um, wow! 
But, uh, and I always found that sort of interesting because, you know, an economist, uh, I forget who it was a long time ago, once calculated that, you know, if you really just wanted to survive and get nutrients mm. um, and ignored the agricultural thing, measures that the Department of Agriculture does, you need a lot of bananas yeah, uh, because they're high in potassium and other right, good things. Right. And, and so, you know, there's a certain, it's an arbitrary aspect to it. And I just, I just want to add, I was in Costco yesterday and uh, eggs there right now are, um, I think it's $8 for two dozen, for five dozen, excuse me. So eggs are, you know, that's mm -hmm. not, that's not mm -hmm. expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, you, eggs are very, very, uh, you know, protein mm -hmm. effective. And, mm -hmm. but what, what's interesting about that, number of course is that it's not exactly literally the minimum you'd need in food to survive it's some kind of diet what's good about the number of course is it's a it's it's a number it's a measure it, right it, and, and right. it's kept it's been kept consistent yes over time yes. as opposed to the pressure that some people have suggested yes. and there's an argument for it that says yeah. you know absolute poverty isn't what matters it's relative poverty mm -hmm. maybe we should use half the median income right. Right. right uh the same issue especially comes up in international measures Absolutely. of poverty yeah. Yeah. um but the last thing i want to add of course yeah. is that all those measures have the issue that cost of living is very different in biloxi mississippi than it is in san francisco yes. california and of course this is yes. a national single yeah. number not yeah, related to where you live. Yeah, and that's that's certainly a, is another critique that you know that twenty thousand dollars in Ames, Iowa means a lot different than that twenty thousand dollars in New York City or San Francisco yep. or Boston. So the measure does not take that into account. But um, but I do I, I like your point, which is that there is some definite advantage that it has remained consistent over this yeah. period of time and allows us to look over over time. The other thing I should mention, which is obvious, but the um, these poverty lines each year uh, take into account um, uh, changes in the cost of living and inflation. So each year they're updated right. uh, to take that into account. So obviously, uh, you know, the, what it costs today is not the same as 50 years ago. And, and the poverty mm -hmm. line reflects that. Last point to talk about, and we may come mm -hmm. back to this, which I think is a very important, is that while we care a lot about material well-being, mm -hmm. it's not all we care about. And mm -hmm. I think all often these discussions of state of the economy, who is it helping, uh, how are we doing economically, it's important to remember that contrary to the most basic models of economics, contrary to those models, people don't just care about how much stuff they have. In, mm. in the standard models that 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 undergrads and graduate students e in economics learn, learn the uh, your well-being is a function of how much stuff you have. Now, it occasionally gets that measure gets improved by people pointing out, well, and it, stuff includes say how well you get along with your spouse, <laughs> and that's okay. But but it's still the problem that it's stuff, it, it, even though that's a particularly ethereal kind of stuff. In theory and economics, if you if you have more stuff holding the ethereal parts constant, you're better off. And if you have the same amount of stuff, you're just as well off. And in that model, if you are working and getting satisfaction from your work and earning, say, $25,000 a year, and you're not poor because of that, you're making, say, $12 an hour, and you're living by yourself, so you're definitely not poor by the official measure, and that is replaced by a $25,000 a year check by the government, you're still not poor, mm -hmm. but it's maybe the case. In fact, mm -hmm. in the economic model, mm -hmm. you are no better off and no worse off. You've got the same amount of stuff. Mm -hmm. But we it, know that people get satisfaction from things other than stuff, like self-sufficiency, independence, autonomy, pride. Absolutely. And so I think it's important just to note that we're going to mainly be talking about monetary measures of poverty and not right. worrying about dignity, which I right. like to always point out is not in the data set. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, most, uh, you know, I did a book a few years ago on the American dream and, uh, and, you know, kind of what you're saying really came through that, that almost everybody, you know, um, finds dignity through work and through their jobs and through other things. But I will say that 
Uh, there has also been, and, and I, I know you're familiar with Armatya Sen, and he's he's economist, and you know won the Nobel Prize a number of years ago, and he um, talked about the, these issues in an interesting way, in which he said, what the way we should really define poverty is that it represents a lack of freedom. And the argument there is that if you don't have these necessities, you are really constrained in what you can do in your life. That it's not just not having those necessities, but what that means in terms of your lifestyle. And so, you know, he talks about, you know, the anxiety and the, the, uh, all of these kinds of things that are associated with poverty that go beyond just sort of the material well-being. So I think that that's, that is a really important point for us to keep in mind. And as you said, most of the conversation is on just not having enough income, but there are these other things as well. Yeah, if you have to worry about paying your rent and that that worry doesn't just hang over you it may require you to occasionally find a second source of income that's erratic that anxiety worry obviously makes it hard to interact with your children in a productive yeah. thoughtful kind loving way so it, it obviously is so much more than just the amount of stuff you have and of course the timing of it matters the uncertain the how much at risk it is, whether it will last uh, for a yeah. while. You know, I'm blessed. Yeah. And I think you are probably blessed yeah. to to live in a world where, for yourself, that you know, if if I lost my job, right? Uh, if, if Washington University closed its sociology department, even if you, I assume you have tenure mark, but if they closed the sociology to. department, yeah. it might it might be a little bit unpleasant for you, but you, you could find things to do that would bring in a healthy amount of money. It's sure. some in some way. Other people don't have that assurance uh, and live very, uh, very fragilely, and it's um, yeah. That's part of what we're going to talk about. Yeah, and that's and that brings up an interesting point, which is um, that there are different. There's different kinds of poverty out there, and you know, a lot of my work is focused on, and which we'll talk about. I know. Um, sort of the life course risk of poverty of people experiencing poverty at some point in time. And most people who do experience poverty do so for fairly short periods of time, but there are folks that are in poverty for long periods of time. And that's, as you're rightfully pointing out, that's a different kind of a psychological thing than, than knowing that, oh, you know, I'm going through a tough period, but it's going to be okay down the road. Um, so I think that, that that's really important to lay out. Yeah. And I, well, let's turn to your book now, um, yeah. which was way too bleak for me. Uh, so, but so I know I have a bias toward optimism and cheerfulness about, well, about the economy I, yeah. overall. Yeah. But but this was pretty unrelentingly bleak. So I'm going to let you lay out some of the bleakness. <laughs> okay. And I'll challenge it some. Maybe you can change okay. my mind a little bit. Okay. Maybe I'll get you to add some, you know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I actually, you know, I'm kind of guardedly optimistic. So maybe at the end we can kind of have a hopeful, hopeful note to this. Yeah. That'd be <laughs> awesome. And and you have you have done work that is, I would call, cheerful. So that's not in this book, so we'll, yes. maybe we'll talk about yes. that too. My, in fact, my my book on the American dream is is we might call it cheerful, uh, yeah, because it's uh, that that's something that I think is really important. Anyway, okay, so let's start with um, one of the ways your book's organized is around some of the myths that people have about poverty, and I do mm -hmm. think uh, I agree with you. I think people it's a little, it's, it's poverty's a little bit like foreign aid. Yeah, have a very uh, yes right un moored <laughs> right <laughs> numerical assessment yeah. of it yeah of the magnitudes uh so we've already yeah. mentioned one issue which is yeah. about 10 percent of the of households i think it is not individuals yeah. fall below the poverty line as officially defined well actually actually it is individuals so 10 and a half oh, that one. Okay. percent of individuals in the united states are in poverty but the, but the, as we talked about the measure is a household measure but it then it counts how many individuals are in the household excellent well said um one of the first things you talk about, which mm -hmm. I think is is very thought provoking, mm -hmm. even though I'm somewhat skeptical of it, mm -hmm. is the us them yeah. distinction. So talk about yeah what you're trying to the point you're trying to make there. Yeah. So the, the the basic point, and this is kind of a theme throughout the book, that uh, that the way that we've we've generally looked at poverty and understood poverty is as an issue of them rather than an issue of us. And what I mean by that is that uh, poverty for many people is, are, is thought of as, oh, it will happen to somebody else. 
um, but it's not going to happen to me. And so a number of years ago, um, myself and my um, colleague at Cornell, uh, Tom Herschel, um, we wanted to look at this question of um, not how many people are poor in any given year or how long are people in poverty, but what's the lifetime risk of experiencing poverty? And so we've done a lot of work on that question using this large longitudinal data set called the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, which has been following people for over 50 years, and use that data to look at what's the probability of an American experiencing poverty. And, and what we found was that between the ages of 20 and 75, close to 60% of Americans would experience at least one year below the official poverty line, which is what we were talking about earlier. And three quarters of Americans would experience a year below in poverty or near poverty, which we defined as below 150% of the poverty line. So the idea that you know poverty only happens to other people is not correct. It actually will affect the majority of Americans. And I think that that puts a different spin on this issue. It's, it's the, again, getting to this issue of, you know, so often we view poverty as affecting somebody else, but not affecting me. And this, is, this work shows that actually, again, uh, three quarters of Americans will experience at least one year in poverty or near poverty. And I should say, just sort of adding on to that, um, in this uh, book that I was referring to about the American dream, we used a broader measure of economic insecurity. And so we looked at poverty, we looked at it, whether you might experience a spell of unemployment during the year or whether you might ex use a social safety net program. And if you use that measure, which is a broader measure, we found that between 25 and 60, 79% of Americans would experience one year in which one of those three things or more happened to them. So there's a lot of, of economic vulnerability that you find across people's lifetimes. Now, people say, well, how, how can that be? How, how, how can you have, you know, and maybe Russ, you're thinking like, ah, I'm one you know, of those people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, why is that? <laughs> but you have to you have to um think about this that we're talking about a spell of 20 30 40 years during that that's a lot of time to be considering during that time things happen to people that they didn't anticipate like losing a job or a pandemic occurring yep. or or getting sick or a family splitting up and all of those things have the potential to throw people in poverty so when you look over longer periods of time there is much more probability of these risks happening let me just clarify the data point that you're drawing on there because you said it quickly you said between 25 and 60, you mean between the ages of 25 and 60, 79% mm -hmm. yes. of Americans will experience at least one of those three things, be below the poverty right. line, be unemployed, or use this, a social uh, safety, safety net, net program, correct? Right, right. So that's a big number, 79%. That is a big number, yeah. And I'm going to challenge it a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, but I wanna first make sure we understand how the that number was calculated on the poverty side. Your measure of, of financial well-being, which gets you yeah. above or below the poverty line, which comes from the panel study of income dynamics, which is the, a fabulous data yeah. set. Yeah. Uh, it, because just to, for listeners who don't know yeah. about it, yeah, it asks a lot of questions about your financial well-being. It's not just mm -hmm. what was your income last year. It tries to right. It tries to get right. Right. At all measures of income, so it's not earnings. Right. It would, it would include this measure, right, I assume, would right. include. Explain what that would include. Yeah, yeah no, it includes a, any kind of income that folks have gotten during the year. The other, the other really valuable thing that they started doing uh, in the mid 1980s was also asking about all of your assets. So, you know, we're talking now about poverty in terms of income, but there's another way of thinking about poverty, which is how, how much assets do you have? How much savings and, and, and these kinds of things do you have? So it's also really valuable for looking at those questions of assets and wealth. The only thing I would add to that is that when people ask me my income on a farm, I never tell the truth. Uh, I pick a number that's high enough, I think, to get me the, say, the credit card without revealing my actual... <laughs> number and and so i think people do have some 
intimacy issues with their money. Uh, probably I'm not alone. So I don't. I always wonder about the asset side of that. Um, it it's a um, and the income part to some extent because mm -hmm. it's self reported. Obviously, people in that survey vary in how eager they are to be accurate and how sociologists and economists measure stuff. But it's something. Yeah, to think about. and they yeah, and that's a, you know that's a that's a valid point in any kind of survey research is you know how how accurate are people's responses? But they've done sort of checking with other data, and it it, it seems like it's it's for the most part it's pretty accurate data. And it and as you said, it's it's a really valuable data set because it is the the lar the the longest longitudinal data set not only in the United States but in the world. So that it's really valuable. It started, just as a footnote, it started with 5,000 families mm -hmm. that were disproportionately sampled to be poor. I think 3,000 mm -hmm. poor families, 2,000. Again, for listeners who don't know the data set, which I assume is almost all of you, uh, and I happen to know a little bit about it because I used to use it and consume data research from it when I was a lot younger. Uh, it, it follows people over time and asks them almost the same questions. It was annual for a while, then it became, I think, every other right. year for certain – right things. Right. But the most interesting part of it that we haven't mentioned yet is that if you were – when the survey started in 1968, if you were, say, uh, un, uh, married but without children, it would follow your kids – or with children, either way. It would follow your kids as they grew up, and then when they started their own households, they became new data points in the survey as well as being, I think, linked to their – Original families, correct? Yes, and correct. So the yeah. sample's not now much greater than five thousand exactly. families. Exactly. Do you know how big it is, roughly? Uh, you know, I, that's a really good question. Um, it, you know, it's probably you know twenty. 20 some odd thousand yeah. in terms of the folks. Um, and then and then you know as as what happens is as folks you know die. Um, the the sample is replenished so that it so that at any year it's representative of the United States. That's the other thing that's really valuable here is that it's nationally representative of the United States. So we can make these kind of generalizations based upon that data. Uh, I'd like you to clarify that in, in the following way, and we may cut this if it goes on too long. But I, <laughs> I, I'm kind of yeah. fascinated by that last little point. Yeah. In my memory of work using the PSID, the Panel Study of Income Dynamics that we're talking about, which you draw a lot on for your book, mm -hmm. uh, it started out very much unrepresentative based on income. So it had 3,000 poor families and 2,000 non-poor families. So if you wanted it right. to be representative nationally, right. you had to weight it yes. accordingly. Yes. So I don't understand what yeah. you're saying happened when people die because they could always reweight. So is it to make sure they have enough in subcategories of certain yeah. kinds of family size? And yeah, yeah. And and, and, and you're, you're bringing up a really good point, which is – that yeah, the, in the original sample, they oh, they uh, oversample low income folks. So as you said, about three thousand were low income, two thousand were just general general population. And um, but yes, you can. What you can do is weight that sample, and that's what we've done throughout all of our analysis because we obviously want it to be generalizable. So you weight the sample so that it uh, so that it reflects the overall um, population. Okay, so let's. Let's get to the um, yeah to the findings of your book. So this first point mm -hmm. about the us them, which I think is really interesting, but I'm skeptical about it for the in the following way. Um, I assume I've been poor in my twenty to I'm sixty six, but since I from the age of twenty to sixty six, there were many years I was poor. Uh, I am not a poor person, meaning I'm not destitute. I was mm -hmm. poor when I was an undergraduate. I was poor as a graduate student. There were there were time periods where I didn't have work. Um, you know, I it, but I've never. There's nothing destitute about me. My future mm -hmm. was bright. Mm -hmm. um, it was a temporary thing, and it's not just temporary. It it had none of the Amartya Sen la loss of freedom. In fact, the opposite. I chose poverty for the opportunity to have a skill set that would allow me to avoid poverty. Mm -hmm. So I, when when we have that broad an age range of twenty to seventy five, mm -hmm. and I know and and at the end, of course, p there are people who are poor, the elderly, who maybe have access to things like Medicare. So it's not we're not counting in kind 
I assume benefits or maybe you do, mm-hmm. you can talk mm-hmm. about that. Mm-hmm. Um, housing benefits and so on that may that may not be measured in my formal income. So I'm just that using that measure seems just not the right measure. Well, here's you know here's a way to think about this, Russ, is um, that I think is is helpful. Uh, think about poverty in the same way as we think about sickness. We don't define people as sick people unless they have some kind of chronic illness. People experience sickness throughout their lives. Uh, you know, you, you you get the flu or you get this thing, and you you have that. And and when you have it, um, you know your your life is not so good. But then you get over it. Well much of poverty is the same way. And so the idea of saying poor people is really a misnomer. It really only applies to a small segment of the overall number of folks that experience poverty. Most people are just like what you said. You Now, your situation is a little different because of higher education, things like that, and you're going on to graduate school. But, um, but most people experience a spell of poverty and uh, and then get out of it, and then maybe down the road experience another spell of poverty. So, the the we so often use this term "poor people," but it would be like we're describing sick people, and we would say, "Well, these are sick people." That's again, that's only de- that's only really a small segment of the of the percentage of people who experience some kind of sickness. So, I think that you know, I I think it's it's. Um, you know, it's really important to draw this out um, and to say that most people who do experience poverty, and that that's another, this is another myth that we deal with in this first section, which is the myth that, oh, you know, everybody who experiences poverty are, is there for, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, no, that that is not the case. There is a small segment that of folks that are in poverty for long periods of time, but it's um, it's not most people. A- another really interesting analogy that um, David Elwood a long time ago and Mary Jo Bain at Harvard used, which I think is helpful, is the analogy of a hospital and looking at people in the hospital. Um, most people who go into the hospital do so for a short period of time. But if we were to sample at any point in time people in the hospital, we would have a number of people who are there chronically because they're there month after month after month. But again, most people who go into the hospital do so for a short period of time. But those long-term cases are the ones we would pick up if we were just to walk into the hospital at any point in time. And it's the same ca- the same thing with poverty and welfare. Yeah, it's um, you actually bring it out in another uh piece of work you did that that is this was the more cheerful work I was referring to <laughs> good but but this is an incredibly important point you know we're going to go back and forth a little bit on the data question and how you measured it and mm-hmm. all that but the the insight that you don't want to talk about the poor is the same and understanding that the world's dynamic and understanding looking at a particular snapshot in a point in time may not be representative of the of past snapshots that of what's happened to those people. And it, you can think about it. I, I always think about it with respect to the rich, the top 1%, the top mm-hmm. 10%. People talk about them as if they were groups sitting around scheming against the rest of us, uh, trying to exploit the system. And of course, some of them are <laughs> and, and do it successfully. And yeah. they should be stopped and punished yeah. in my view. But but it's an incredibly dynamic group. It's, so when we talk about the rich, that's in 1973 right. and the rich in 2020 or the poor, they're not the same people when you're looking at two different snapshots. That's incredibly important. And in your earlier work, yes, yes, you talked about the yes, likelihood yes. that at least at some point in your yep. life, they think you'd be in the yep. top 10% was what yeah, you looked at? Yeah, yeah. And it was a shockingly ten, large ten, number. It was, it was. And it's it's the same point, but on the other end of the income yeah. distribution, which is there's a lot of dynamic movement, um, which is, as you said, that this is the more cheerful picture, which is that actually – at some point, folks may do quite well, you know, in their in their lifetime, uh, you know, so their, their annual earnings. So, yes, there's a lot of turnover at the top end. There's also a small segment, as we know, at the top end that is there for a long period of time. <laughs> but most people, um, w- you know, who experience, you know, really um, wealth um, may do so for, you know, fairly short periods of time. So uh, it, 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 I think it's a – and that point – um, you know, I 
most of my work focuses on the bottom end of the income distribution. But this was really interesting because it was finding the same pattern at the top end of the income distribution. Do you remember the percentage? Um, it spends at least one year in the top 10%. It's, it's like, yeah, it's, it's – um, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, we'll I find sh- it. We'll I, reference I, the paper. We'll yeah, link we'll, to the paper. But it's we'll more than – it. the, the part that's interesting is that if the group stayed the same, the top 10% would be about – about 10% of the population would be in the, say, 10, top 10%. But because there's movement in and out and turnover, it's actually quite a bit higher. So, yeah, no, it's it's something like, you know, and I'm just off the top of my head. It's something like, you know, 40% of the population. That was my memory. Yeah, yeah. That, will, that was my will, memory. I didn't want to quote it. find themselves yeah. at some point in that top 10%, which is like, again, you know, uh, almost half of the population. But only for – that's only for a year. That's right. It could That's, just you have a great year. You sell exactly. something, your house, exactly. or whatever it is. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and, and that's and that's kind of the analogy with poverty. You, side, you have yeah. a bad year. Exactly. You, you're unemployed. You struggle to find work, or right. You don't want to find work for a while. You decide what it, whatever it may yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my problem with the book. Actually, <laughs> is that it, it, yeah. Sorry to pick on you, Mark. Um, <laughs> but and that's because you know this. You're. It's a very. I think it's a very deep insight this point about turnover and i do not mean to minimize uh anything about one year in poverty is saying oh that's not a big deal one year mm-hmm. in poverty can be hellish frightening traumatic mm-hmm. and it can ha- damage you for well be- beyond that one year Th- the part i found troubling about the book was the implication that you drew from that number the one you just gave let's say of 79 percent mm-hmm. of Mm-hmm. At one point between the ages of 25 and 60, you'd experience one of these three things. Yeah. Is that you, it, it, it's an indictment of the system. And I don't, I, there are a lot of things about the economic system I think are worth in, indicting it for. I, I, I just felt like you left out a lot of, of anything that was cheerful. And you, 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 the book suggests that there's something horribly wrong when the percentage of people who are in poverty or even just for one year, uh, whatever that number is, we didn't talk about that, but yeah, yeah. Uh, for, I think you said 40% will have at least, no, 60% will have at yeah, least one yeah, year between yeah. the ages of 20 and 75. Yes. And my thought of that is, yeah, a lot of them are grad students and that's really not a tragedy. It's not, it doesn't mean anything for how we ought to change economic policy. So I, my, my, what I'm picking on you for, and I'm going to let yeah. you respond is, yeah, yeah. what's the implication of that number? You, you yeah. say- I mean, I like the point that it's not an us versus them, and all of us will have some years right, right, where right, right, we have right, some right. economic hardship. But does that mean we need to start over? Or? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it, this is this is interesting. So, first of all, the the grad students. I mean, we we've also redone these this analysis and taken out you know the grad students, and it doesn't change the numbers very much. That's a, that's a very small percentage of the overall population. So, um, it's you Fair know enough. what 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 we're seeing is you <laughs> know. I mean, <laughs> Folks who are having a bad year, you know, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever, um, in terms of the poverty. And and you're right that you can look at this, you know, and and it's sort of like, here's the here's the data. Okay. How we interpret that data, we can argue about. Like you, Russ, yeah. you and I can can sort of debate this. Yeah. On one hand, um, we can say, which which I have said in the book and my co-authors, that you know, there's something wrong here when you have so many people experiencing at least one year in poverty or near poverty. On the other hand, and I've talked to many groups and and people will raise this issue, they'll say, well, but this shows that since they're only there for a year or two, that the system is working because they got out of that. And that's not so bad. And, you know, there's, you can, so what I'm saying yeah, full, is that- Half full, half empty kind of argument. Exactly, exactly. And we can interpret this both ways. But what's important is that this idea of you know poverty, first of all, having a wide reach, but its grip is not so strong. This goes against the myths and the stereotypes that are out there. Now, how Fair we enough. Inter- how we interpret this, you know, again, we can debate that, but so, so we're laying this out and, and, and you're right. I mean, we have made a more negative kind of, um, uh, uh, sort of drawn out the negative implications. Um, but I think you're right that you can say, you know, if, if poverty for most people is fairly short term, uh, in a way that that is positive. 
Yeah, and I'm thinking of it a different way. I, let me let me lay it out. Yeah. And you can respond to it. I, yeah. You know what? When I look at the data from that, the same data set you've used, and I've looked at a lot of the studies that have, I think all, as many as I've been able to find of what's happened to people over time, people at the bottom, say in 1980, in that data set, do quite well over the next 20, 30 years of their life. They, they actually grow faster in many of the studies. Their economic well-being grows faster than people at higher, say, quintiles. The bottom 20% grows faster than other slices. Now, some of that just because they started at a low level doesn't mean they absolutely do better. But sometimes they do, though. It's kind of shocking. Uh, and sometimes it's because it's a measurement phenomenon that you, you caught them in a bad year and it's not representative of them and so on. There are a lot of interesting questions there that are often usually uh, ignored. But the thing I would focus on and I want your thoughts on mm -hmm. is, you know, we had Mauricio Miller on the program talking about his book, The Alternative, and he actually focused on what I think is the more imp important issue, which is the number of people who are persistently in poverty. Mm -hmm. And 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 I don't, again, I don't want to say, oh, well, they're only in poverty for three years and they got out, so the mm -hmm. system's working fine. I don't think that's necessarily true, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't use the proportion that experienced some kind of poverty as an indictment of system. What I would indict the system for, and, and I think I worry mm -hmm. that your approach distracts us from this, mm -hmm. are the people, Miller points out and others, you will point out, I'm sure, that it's a mm -hmm. relatively smaller, much smaller group mm -hmm. who are persistently poor, mm -hmm. who struggle to find Mm -hmm. a use for their skills that puts them above the poverty line. And that's the group I think we ought to be the most worried about because the rest of the folks are doing pretty, not just doing pretty well, it's not the right measure, but have opportunities to grow, have opportunities to expand their 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 skill set and and acquire more material well-being as they get older. It's the people who can't, who are stuck in the, in the minimum wage job or around the poverty level job. And those are the ones I think we ought to be focused on. And I worry that this more general point you're making distracts us from that. So talk about whether you, yeah. first, whether you agree or disagree. Yeah. And then let's talk about, whether, is there anything different? Yeah. Isn't there something yeah. different yeah. about that group? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair point. Um, you know, and this gets back to what we were set, talking about at the very beginning, which is there's different kinds of poverty out there. Um, and what you're getting at is, you know, most people would say, um, you know, maybe between 10 and 15% of people who experience poverty are going to do so for long periods of time, are going to be, um, you know, sort of this term of the underclass. Yeah. And I do think that the situation there is different, certainly than folks who experience poverty for a couple of years and then are able to get out. Um, you know, this is much more likely to be folks that are have a real disadvantage in terms of competing in the labor market. Yep. So these are folks of color um, living in areas that are economically depressed, both inner cities and certain rural, rural areas in America. Yeah. Yeah. Um, single parent families, which you pointed out, folks with disabilities, all of these conditions are related to um, individuals being in poverty for long periods of time. And I think that that is a, is a very difficult um, situation, and we definitely need to be addressing that. But I would say, you know, in terms of, you know, is one group more, you know, uh, worthy of attention than the other? I, I would just say that they're different, and that we need to, um, we need to kind of focus on on both of those groups. Um, you know, let me let me let me um, put this in. Well, I mean, we might we we may get to this, but. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that I um, was interested in doing, and we do this in the book, and I did this in an earlier analysis, was to look at the cost, the economic cost of poverty. It's kind of, um, it's, it's getting to your question of, you know, why, why should we be concerned about this, maybe? Um, and so what we did, I did with a graduate student here, is we estimated... Um, what the economic cost of childhood poverty was in the United States in terms of, we know that childhood poverty is associated with higher healthcare costs. We know that childhood poverty is associated with less economic productivity when children become adults. And we know it's related to higher criminal justice costs. So we factored all those things in. 
And what we came up with was, and, and I think this was a conservative number, we came up with the annual cost of childhood poverty in the United States was uh, around $1.1 trillion. And you know your numbers. This is a, this is a big number. This is like this in 2015, this was 20, uh, 28% of the entire federal budget. So the issue here is not that we're not paying for poverty and childhood poverty in particular, but we're paying for this on the back end of the problem rather than the front end of the problem. And from an economic point of view, it's always more effective to deal with a problem on the front end rather than the back end. And that's the other thing that we show in this study is that for every dollar we would spend reducing childhood poverty, we would save between seven and $12 down the road in averting those costs. So not only is the argument that we make is, um, not only is reducing childhood poverty the, the morally right thing to do in this wealthy country, but it's also economically the smart thing to do. It's like smart economic policy to invest in our human capital. So, uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a very, you know, I think that's a compelling argument to make. So I agree with part of it, um, uh, it for a variety of reasons. Like we might get into them uh, I'll say it a different way. If I said, let's spend an extra trillion dollars this year, let's spend 25% of the federal budget this year on fighting poverty, we might struggle to spend that money well. Um, we certainly can give people money. We're, we're, that's, I think my argument's always been government does two things really well. It, it cuts checks and it kills people. It's real, we're really good at fighting wars. Yeah. Government does that better than anybody else. Um, and, and that's important sometimes because unfortunately, to protect yourself, sometimes you need to have an army and so it's okay. Uh, and it's good at transferring money. The other part does, doesn't do so well. And our attempts to transfer money to quote, fight poverty have been, I'd say a very mixed bag. Um, we, can we can alleviate suffering, which is important through spending. But I, I think the part that's challenging here is this question of are people who are poor just like people who aren't poor, but they just have less money? You know, it's the old uh, Hemingway Fitzgerald mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, joke right. on the other end. You know, right. I think Fitzgerald says one of them says the rich are right. different from us. The other one says, yes, they have more money. Right. It's not that's not the only thing that's different. And I think the people I, I don't let let's use that phrase you use the underclass. The mm -hmm. people who are persistently poor mm -hmm. struggle to integrate into the into the economy. Uh, I'm not sure money is the thing they need the most. They often, it might be good for them. They might be happy to have it. it might be a good idea for a lot of mm -hmm. reasons, but it's not the only thing that's wrong is they just don't have enough money. They are maybe de-linked from their family. They don't have skills. Their school was awful. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. got no leadership from family or mentors that other people were able to have. And I, I just think we ought to look I, I think looking at it just a, it's a, for an economist, funny thing to say to, to you, yeah. but I just don't think money is the real essence of the issue. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, we're getting back to that issue of, you know, different types of poverty. But but everything you're talking about there, I mean, I would interpret that as there has been a severe structural failing that results in folks that don't have skills, um, also results in the fact that there aren't any jobs available in some of these areas. And so we need to think about some structural policies to address those kinds of things. So I agree with you that, um, you know, that in some cases, um, money is important, but it's not the only thing. And we need to, we need to focus on these other kinds of structural issues. So, you know, one of the examples you talk about in the book is education. I, I suspect we somewhat agree on that. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the people who end up poor in the United States were often handicapped by a mediocre or atrocious education, uh, often also by other factors like family structure, but not having a, a two parents, I think, is a challenge for folks. But just looking at education, you are skeptical mm -hmm. of that as uh, – uh, uh, the recent guest we had on uh, Frederick de Boer uh, in his book doesn't like this view that education will solve everything. You also are skeptical. Why? Yeah, yeah. So that because that is the human capital argument. It we is. Need to invest it in is. People. It is. And and here's you know here's the way that we lay out to think about this. Um, 
increasing somebody's education is a great individual strategy for averting poverty. No doubt about it. There's, you know, for decades, we, we've shown that those with more education uh, are, are earn more money and have a and have a lower risk of poverty. No question about it. So on an individual level, uh, increasing somebody's skills, increasing their educations is a great strategy to avoid poverty. On a macro level, it's not going to work unless we deal with the structural failings. And the analogy that I use um, in the book is the one of musical chairs, which is to say, okay, let's imagine we have a game of musical chairs where there are 10 players playing and eight chairs available. Circle around, music stops, two people lose out. So we can say, okay, who lost out at that game? Uh, well, you know, somebody, they weren't as fast, they weren't as agile, they were in a bad position when the music stopped. All those reasons are valid for why those two people lose out. But if we step back and we say, wait a minute, the structure of the game is set up so that two people are gonna lose out. It doesn't really matter what those characteristics are. And so the argument that we're making is that we're playing a large scale version of musical chairs. There aren't enough chairs for players playing the game. Why aren't there enough chairs? There aren't enough jobs that pay a decent wage. There aren't enough jobs that have decent benefits attached to them. We don't have things like healthcare and childcare and affordable housing that other countries provide. And so somebody's gonna lose out. Well, who's gonna lose out? Well, it's gonna be folks that are not as competitive in the labor market. They have less education, skills, they're single parent families. All of those things are valid for why those individuals lost out. But again, if we step back, it, it's all it's doing is, is, is sort of indicating who loses out, not why there are losers in the first place. And what we need to focus on is this question of why there are losers in the first place. The other way to think about this, the other analogy would be as a queue. Imagine a queue of people lined up and the good jobs are, you know, those sort of at the, at the front of the line. Um, we can, but there are only so many of those good jobs for the people that are lined up in the queue. Well, we can shuffle people up and down in terms of their order in that queue, in terms of getting a good job, but they're still going to be the same people that lose out at the end of the game, at, at the end of the, of the time. So, um, you know, or, or, or picture this. Let's imagine, Russ, that automatically, overnight, everybody has a college degree. Does that mean that we've just solved poverty? No. Those, those dead-end jobs are still going to be there. It's, they're just going to be filled by people with a college degree. So that's the, that's the analogy that, that, that we use that I think is, um, you know, at, at least I find it helpful to think about this. Okay, but so, I, I, I'm sure that you, you might disagree with that. Yeah, let me try to <laughs> okay. give an alternative perspective okay. there. Okay. So before we do that, um, by the way, whether everyone getting a college degree is good or bad, for poverty is going to partly depend on whether college is a signal or an actual acquisition of talent and of skill. Uh, there are people who think it's mostly just a piece of paper. If everybody, if more people have the piece of paper, I agree with you. If that's all it is, and mm -hmm. I think there's that's a serious mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. It also, of course, depends on what you study. Uh, there are some fields that pay better than others, and some equip you better for workforce success. But I would never argue that college is should focus only on what the market uh, marketable skills yeah. you acquire. In fact, I think that's antithetical to real education often. So I'm going to put that to the side. Uh, and before I get to why I think your musical chairs issue is not the right one, I, I, I want to raise an issue that's, I think, interesting. People will say, oh, well, it's easy to escape poverty. All you have to do is graduate from high school, mm -hmm. get married, go to college, graduate from college, you can get married after that. It's okay. The order's not important. But if you've graduated from college and, you've, and you're married and you wait to have children until you're married and have uh, a college degree, you will have an economically lovely life. And I think that's true ex post. I think it's true that the people who do those things tend to do well. I think people draw the wrong conclusion. Um, here's where I'm going to kind of agree with you before I disagree, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is, oh, well, we'll just get more people to get to college and stay Right. Uh, stay right. stay on and wait to have ch children until they're married. Uh, the people who go to college, get married, and have children in the right order, they're not the same people. They're not exactly, they're not a random sample. And so 
it's not informative. It's not necessarily a policy lever we want to use, a dial we want to dial up to avoid poverty. It's, you know, to me, it's a, it's a little bit analogous to saying we need more professional basketball players because obviously they have higher salaries than the average. If we can get a bigger proportion of the population in basketball, we'll, we'll have more stuff. Well, that's really wrong. That's mm -hmm. just a fundamental logical error. And so just because college is, is, is correlated with economic success, we don't really know how much that economic success comes from college. So that's where I think mm -hmm. we have, where we, I assume we're in agreement on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where we disagree is the musical chairs thing. I don't think there's any structural problem with the U.S. economy in that area. Mm -hmm. I think we have a horrible education system. I do think there are barriers to getting into the room with the chairs, like licensing and minimum mm -hmm. wage, which I think makes it hard to get the skills that you might start to get out that would help you get into the room. But the problem with the fundamental idea that there's a fixed number of jobs or that there's a fixed number of good paying jobs, I think is not true. And, and, and the evidence I would give for it on the other side is that, you know, between 19, roughly 1960, late 50s, early 60s till the present, it's an enormous increase in the labor force participation of women. Mm -hmm. Enormous increase. That didn't increase the unemployment rate. It didn't increase the, the uh, number of people uh, who were unemployed because there weren't enough chairs to go around. More chairs got put out because these the women who, who joined the labor force had a lot of skills and people found new ways to associate with each other to create companies that could employ them. And that's the problem in my view is that we don't have a set of skills for the two people who can't get a chair. And if we could give them the skills, it's not college per se, not a degree in, I'm not gonna pick anything to embarrass that field, but it, it's that they don't have enough skills. That's the problem. Well. Um Two things there. Uh, in the in the analogy, um, I we do say that the game is dynamic; that it can vary; that you can have nine chairs for ten players, or only six. Um, clearly, when we look at what's happened economically, for example, the Great Recession, or recently with the pandemic, the number of chairs available has been reduced. I mean, there's no question about that. Yeah, true. The other thing about um, the labor force participation is, as you know, men's labor force participation has been coming down at the same time that women's has been going up. Yep. That's an indication that maybe there are a limited number of chairs available. Um, so but the total numbers increased dramatically. And I, yeah, I, I just yeah. think most people don't know that. It's just important to point it out that, you know, for yeah. example, when yeah. people say trade deficits reduce take jobs, trade reduces jobs. We have an enormously larger number of tr amount of trade than we had 50 years ago, and we have a lot more jobs. There, you can't want to just look, and I'm not suggesting that proves right. that they're wrong it, or, or that I'm right, it, but it does prove that the number of jobs is not fixed. It's not a zero-sum game. It's really, I think, crucial. Right. The the um, and, and again, I would agree that the the game itself uh, is a dynamic game that can yeah, that can vary over time. The other thing that that I talk about um, in the book, which goes against this, are so basically this this the argument I'm making is kind of a zero sum kind of game, but there is an argument to be made, which I think there is some validity to, to say actually. If you do provide more education for everybody and skills, what you do is you create a more innovative workforce, which can create actually more opportunities, kind Absolutely. of what you're talking about here. And I do think that there's some validity to that. But I think where we, where we sort of always drop the ball is we just say, if we only focus on, um, let's just increase everybody's education. And we don't at the same time think about the fact that, I mean, as you know, the economy has been producing more and more low wage jobs. I mean, there's no question about that. It's estimated that um, the last couple of years of, uh, in terms of the labor force about, you know, roughly 40% of the jobs are considered low wage, which at the time was about $16 or less an hour. So, you know, it's like we are producing more jobs, low wage jobs, part-time jobs, jobs without benefits. And that gets at the fact that there, you know, that that we're reducing the number of chairs in the analogy. So, you know, I do, but I do think it, there is this counter argument that says, 
if you do make your workforce more skilled and have greater levels of education, you create a more dynamic workforce. And I do think that there definitely is something to that argument. So I don't want to just say, oh, forget, you know, education and skills. No, I mean, and, and if there are jobs available and people don't have the skills for them, then obviously we do need to provide those skills in education. So it's not, you know, I don't want to just simply provide just one sort of side to that argument. Yeah, I, I, I think I just think it's the it's not. I know people use that kind of language all the time. The economy has produced a lot of low wage jobs. I I don't think that's a fruitful way to think about the emergent nature of of entrepreneurship and the way that people find work um, as if it's some kind of you know widget machine called high. Yeah, why don't we just have it produce more high wage jobs? And I think it's endogenous. It means it's part of the system, and some of those. Results come from the choices we make as individuals and the policies we, we put in place, some of which are awful, uh, particularly, I think, around schooling. So to make one small distinction, mm -hmm. you, you said um, – I know you didn't mean this, but you said you know, producing more education and skills as if they're two separate things. And, of course, in some sense they are, right? You, you go to school, yeah, and sometimes – School has skills associated with it, but there are other ways we get skills, obviously. Right. But I think it's really important that in a lot of the data that we're looking at, we don't we can't measure education. We can measure how many years people sat at the desk, uh, and that's not the same thing, unfortunately. You can you can be in school, and this is particularly a problem I think in poor societies uh, outside the United States, where nothing happens except that you're not working. You're just sitting at the desk. What, what we care about is education right. that add something it doesn't have to be marketable right. skills but but there's education happening now we yeah. can't observe education so we observe this surrogate called years of schooling right they're not the same i just want right, to right it's just a pet peeve of mine i like right. to get that in <laughs> right yeah no well taken uh let's close with um some of these structural things that you might mm -hmm. think need fixing yeah. uh, or the policies that you think would be helpful. Yeah. Obviously, a, a larger uh, safety net would reduce yes. material suffering. Uh, we could argue it has other consequences. We might not like those, but might decide it's worth it. But what are some of the structural things, given these issues that you're worried about that, you know, I'm skeptical, but yeah. who cares? Your turn. Yeah. <laughs> okay. talk, about, talk about what we might do in your view to make it better. Yeah. So, um, so this is where, you know, we kind of started out about, you know, optimism and, and pessimism. And this is where I, I, from my perspective, I'm somewhat opt guardedly optimistic that, um, that we are starting to think about policies, um, kind of that, that get at more of these structural issues. So, um, you know, one of the first things, you know, a, a, as we were just talking about that I, I feel is problematic is that we have all this low wage kind of uh, employment out there. And so we need to have policies that get those wages up. So I'm certainly in favor of raising the minimum wage. Um, you know, and, and as we know, there's a lot of debate about, you know, what, what affects that, what have, but, um, you know, as president Biden has said, it's, it seems fundamentally wrong if somebody's working full time and they're still in poverty. So, um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of talk about that. Um, interestingly, there's talk about, uh, you know, in the in the latest um, pandemic um, relief package of uh, you know a child allowance, which is an idea that has been in European countries for decades. But the fact that both President Biden and Senator Romney, you know, on the Republican side, have proposed this idea is actually you know fairly radical for the United States. So the idea there is that if you have children, you you get a certain amount on a monthly basis to help in raising those children. Um, the 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 proposal in the in the uh, in the bill was I think three hundred dollars a month, something like that. Um, and so um, so I think that those are those are really important policies. You know that we need to think about other other ways of sort of getting wages up is through the earned income tax credit, which is actually the largest anti-poverty cash program that we have right now. Um, so those are, those are things that focus on that. As you said, the safety net, strengthening the safety net, I think is critical, but also thinking about the safety net in a broader context. So I think it's wrong that we're the only country in the developed, in Western industrialized countries that 
that doesn't provide universal health care. I think we should provide that. I, I think that that hurts us in many ways. I think we should provide affordable and accessible child care. I think that that pays, you know, as we, I talked about earlier, pays off in the long term. Um, so I think those are kind of policies that are important. And the other thing that I'll mention, um, just in terms of, of, of policy, is um, policies that build um, uh, lower income folks' assets. Um, we have those kind of policies for middle and upper income uh, individuals. They can deduct their home mortgage interest, um, and that allows them to build their asset in their home. But we should think about policies that also allow lower income individuals to build their assets, because that's more of a long-term strategy for poverty, is allowing people to build their assets that will protect them when they experience these spells of poverty down the road. So those are interesting ideas. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, Poverty hasn't been an important issue in the United States in a long time in public discourse, which is weird to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I've criticized, you know, my free market colleagues for failing to deal with the underclass issue, this, the persistence mm -hmm. of, of poverty. Uh, Mark, it won't surprise you that I think raising the minimum wage could make the problem worse. Yeah, I know. Uh, by <laughs> pricing some people out of the market. I know, market. I know, I know. But that's an empirical question that, yeah. you know, reasonable people can disagree about. Um, and, and while I might wish that economists had a unified front on it, I certainly don't demand it of other social scientists. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the, data, the data are very, are very mixed. I, you know, I, I think a reasonable person could uh, make either argument. So, uh, but do you think this issue of, of, of front and center. I, I think it's a tragedy. And this is yeah. what I say. I'm critical of my free market friends. Yeah. And my free market friends talk about how great the American economy is. I think there's yeah. plenty of things wrong with it, some of which are policy related, not related to so called free capitalism. But I, 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 there's something wrong. You can debate what it is, but there's something wrong when there is a large, persistent group of people who yeah. struggle. Now, I'm not talking yeah. about yeah. Um, people with mental health issues who might struggle to lead what we might call a mainstream life. That's a different issue. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about people who don't have mental health issues, who, mm -hmm. who it is, there's something tragic. I'll just say tragic, I won't say, I mm -hmm. think I forget what the Biden phrase was, something terribly mm -hmm. tragic that people who, who are mentally healthy still struggle to acquire the skills in the economy as, as powerful and, and extraordinary yeah. as ours. Yeah. And, and I wish we would focus on that yeah. as a yeah. policy issue, as to what's gone wrong there and to look more granularly at what holds them back, whether it's the minimum wage, licensing restrictions, which are increasingly egregious in the United States. And maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe that's not what holds them back, but I, I'd like yeah. to see people as talented as you yeah, yeah. hone in on that group per se. Yeah. What do you think of that? Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I think, you know, I think this is what Trump tied into and actually Bernie Sanders on the left yep, tied absolutely. into this idea that, you know, folks feel like they're not getting ahead, that yep. they're working, they're they're hardworking, but they're not, they're falling behind it. And I think that that is the absolute critical issue it, now and in the future. So I totally agree with you. So that, that might be a good spot for us to end on this total agreement here. My guest today has been Mark Rank. His book is poorly understood. Mark, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Oh, you're welcome, Russ. I enjoyed it a lot. Me too. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.